My name is Vasil Dichev, and today I'm going to talk to you about Scala. So first of all, since lunch is after this lecture, if there are any questions for which the answer is uh, longer, maybe we have to postpone it for the lunch break. Um, and then since I um, always forget, uh, remind me to repeat the question if you don't have a microphone. So, right, let's start. So why did I come here to talk to you today about Scala? Um, so what uh, have I been doing in the past? Uh, so like most of you, I have been working uh, for most of my career with Java technologies. I started with j then I um, also used uh, Spring for a while. Um, I tried uh, Python and Ruby for uh, some one of uh, scripts and tasks. And I liked some of the things in Python and in Ruby compared to Java. Uh, it was a lot shorter, uh, more expressive. Uh, Java, on the other hand, was statically typed, which has some advantages. And then eventually I discovered Scala and found that it has many of the uh, benefits of both Java and dynamic lang languages like Python and Ruby. Um, I have worked on a couple of uh, open source projects. And for four years now, I'm working uh, um, primarily in Scala. Um, and my colleagues usually tease me that I'm the only Scala developer in Bulgaria. Um, so for a while, that might have been the case. But um, uh, fortunately, this has changed in the last year or two. Uh, so in, in our company, uh, I'm currently uh, teaching a couple of developers to, um, so that they can uh, use Scala as well. And um, I hear of other companies which are also trying Scala in, in Sofia. And I hope after this presentation you would be um, interested in trying out Scala, if not um, at work, then at least um, to play with it at home. Um, so what am I trying to do with this presentation, uh, mostly. So I don't uh, have the hope that in a year everybody will be programming in Scala. I don't think that's uh, even beneficial. Uh, but at least uh, I would like to encourage you to try Scala. That would, be, uh, would have been a success for me. And now that Java has, um, now with Java 8, it, it has come so close to Scala that it, it's, it's it's never been easier for a Java developer to learn Scala. So uh, Java is actually approaching what Scala has been for a while. And also, if you, uh, even if you never use Scala, there are a lot of things to learn from Scala. Scala has uh, been on that road before. And there are many lessons that can be learned. Uh, for example, for me, I already um, was quite accustomed with the changes in Java 8. Uh, just because I have been using Scala and many of the features are uh, quite uh, similar, as, as you see. So what is Scala? Actually, it's a language. It's a programming language. Uh, it's object-oriented, first of all. It's functional. Uh, it uh, is also statically typed, like uh, Java is, like uh, C++, for example. It also runs on the JVM. And it's, it's compatible with uh, Java project. It generates um, a bytecode. So when you compile a Scala class, it compiles to bytecode. Uh, Scala can invoke Java. Java can invoke Scala. It's uh, maybe one of the most JVM um, orient uh, one of the most compatible uh, JVM languages. Um, and also uh, one interesting thing, like dynamic languages, it has uh, REPL, which is uh, short for read about print loop is just a fancy name for, for a shell where you can try out uh, different commands uh, instead of having to type them in an ID and compile them. And um, there are many online uh, such REPLs. One is www.simplyscala.com. You can try some of the examples now. Um, and we'd be lucky if we don't crash the server uh, at the end of the, lec uh, the lecture. Um, so, let's start. Um, first of all, 
who are some of the companies uh, uh, that are using Scala? Well, uh, now uh, there are many companies, popular companies, big companies. You probably know most of them uh, who are uh, using Scala. This has uh, definitely uh, developed rapidly, fairly rapidly in the last three or four year, years. So uh, there has been a lot of uptake um, in Scala. Some of the first ones were um, uh, Twitter, for example, Foursquare, LinkedIn. Uh, you know, the companies which were uh, startups at the time and then uh, experienced um, explosive growth. Um, and why would you want to learn Scala? Uh, well, Scala, uh, first of all, is an expressive language. It's a powerful language. Uh, it's um, much easier to uh, express certain ideas uh, instead of typing boiler code, uh, boil boilerplate code uh, again and again. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's a fun language. For me, uh, I have been using it for uh, uh, about seven years now, and it's, it's still fun. It is definitely more fun than many other languages out there. Uh, and it's very productive. So I, I can personally um, say that uh, if you, um, there are many things which can be expressed much more clearly. Uh, you make less mistakes, so it takes less time. Um, and it's, it's something which um, even one of our dev managers has uh, commented lately that he has noticed that, that there are some improvements um, when me or some of my colleagues are using Scala compared to um, Java for some types of projects. Uh, one main reason why uh, you would want to try it is uh, because it's educational. You would learn something about uh, Java, about the state of the in industry, um, in what direction it's moving, and also it's probably uh, the language on the JVM platform, um, which is, um, well, after Java, it's, it's, it's one of the more popular, it's, it's fairly influential, and if you, uh, I have recently checked uh, to see on the OpenJDK mailing list, whenever they're uh, discussing a new feature, there's always a comparison with Scala. And, and um, um, there are also uh, even some features which uh, have been implemented uh, by the same people for uh, Java and for Scala, as we'll see in the next slides. So this man is uh, called Martin Odersky. Um, he's the creator of Scala. Uh, but uh, he first started with uh, another prototype language called Pizza uh, uh, back in 1997. And then, uh, then Sun Microsystems, um, who were the owners of Java at the time, um, they delegated the task of creating a generic version of Java because they um, were aware that Pizza um, used generics and that was part of the work of Martin Udersky. Um, at about the same time, uh, he also created Scala. And next year, uh, what was then known as GJ, Generic Java, actually became Java 5. So what you are all uh, using now uh, is based on, on uh, Martin Odersky's work uh, on generics. Uh, in fact, he rewrote the Java C compiler uh, at the time because it was uh, much easier uh, in order to integrate generics to to create a, uh, um, to rewrite everything from scratch, and, and um, he, um, as a university professor, has some knowledge about uh, type systems, which which he used in that. So uh, it's a little known fact that the Java C you're using today was actually created by Martin Odersky, who is also the creator of Scala. So that's the first uh, very major influence. Uh, um, the uh, same creator um, for uh, Java generics and for Scala. Uh, and fairly recently, in 2011, um, a commercial company was uh, founded called TypeSafe, um, which was uh, supposed to support uh, and consult, consult um, uh, in everything uh, Scala-related. And uh, there were, of course, uh, many uh, luminaries from the Java world who were involved as um, advisors. And uh, some of them are James Gosling, the creator of Java, Duck Lee, uh, the creator of uh, many concurrent utilities and, and uh, um, books about concurrency, Rod Johnson, who is 
um, the creator of the uh, Spring framework, Rod Johnson, later on uh, became also um, a, a member of the directors uh, for TypeSafe. So Java people are in interested in Scala very much. Uh, <coughs> and now on to, um, uh, we'll go on and, and have a, a comparative review of um, Java and Scala. So let's start with uh, the Java features in Java 8. Well, m the most important feature uh, uh, around which many other things revolve is uh, undoubtedly lambdas, lambdas and, uh, uh, and virtual methods, which um, are um, in a way created to make the transition to lambdas easier. And in a survey conducted by uh, TypeSafe uh, last year, I think, um, this was probably the most uh, anticipated and favorite feature, uh, lambdas and virtual uh, methods. And uh, then a uh, second one is the usage of lambdas, not lambdas as a core feature, but usage of lambdas in core uh, libraries, uh, such as streams. So uh, what we are going to look at now is the following Java 8 features. We look at uh, lambda expressions, the um, Type inference, which uh, Java is doing, uh, however limited it is. Uh, method references, default methods, streams. Uh, we'll briefly look at some types of uh, uh, parallelism, and also the new optional type. And with each and every um, of these features, we will compare it with what Scala uh, has, and, and we will see that most of these features uh, have more, more or less equivalents or, or even more pow powerful features in Scala. Okay, so um, initially, so this is not the current uh, uh, Lambda syntax, but initially what was proposed on the, on the mailing list uh, for the syntax of Java Lambdas was, was this. So the um, arrow that connected the parameters and the body of the Lambda, um, was uh, constructed with an equal sign and um, more than sign. And meanwhile, Scala has this syntax, which looks very similar. So if I put this side by side, can you tell which is Java and which is Scala? It's, it's possible, but it's, it's not very easy at first sight. So they are really indeed very similar, at least initially. And um, what Brian gets uh, uh, set in justifying this uh, syntax is, well, we felt it was better to choose, to choose something which is already in use. Well, later on, um, uh, Brian gets and, and, and the committee decided that there would be some confusions uh, from programmers uh, who, who might confuse this with uh, uh, more than or equals and so on. So um, eventually, um, they decided to uh, use the arrow. But other than that, um, Scala's anonymous functions are almost the same as um, uh, Java's library, uh, Java's Lambda expressions, at least uh, at first sight. There are some differences, as you might have noticed. For example, the types, if you want to annotate the types, um, they're separated with a column from the um, parameter names and are on the right, whereas in Java they're on the left. And also, in functions in Scala, you can use the underscore if you're going to use a parameter just once. You can use underscores. So first parameter is the first underscore, second parameter is the second underscore. Usually that's um, used in um, only very short uh, functions where you don't want to uh, type boilerplate. However, under the surface, there are some differences. For example, do you know what type Java's Lambda expressions have? They actually don't uh, have their own um, type. They, they take the form, they take the type of the single, um, the single ax uh, uh, abstract method uh, interface that they're assigned to. So this is why it's possible to write the same Lambda expression uh, to variables of a different type, like runnable or, or callable void, but you can't assign one to the other. 
Um, whereas in Scala, lambda expressions or, or anonymous functions, um, so they're, they're more than uh, lambda expressions, uh, so uh, they have their own type. Uh, there is a function type. So, in fact, when we um, have a print -line expression, it, it has a type from unit to unit, so it doesn't, uh, uh, it takes zero parameter and produces unit, which is the same as void in, in Java, basically. And this is short for creating a new object, which is a function, function zero with zero parameters, with a method apply. So that's what uh, essentially Scala uh, anonymous functions decompose to. And this has some advantages as well. Um, I'll go quickly through one of them. Uh, for example, there is a, a thing called a partial function, which is a subclass of function. And the difference is that partial functions have a specified domain for which the uh, parameter uh, of the function is defined. And uh, what this um, means implementation-wise is that there is a method is defined at which can test before running whether um, a certain parameter is defined in this uh, domain. And you can use uh, freely uh, in uh, wherever a partial function is, is um, uh, expected. So this is uh, uh, syntax, which, uh, so case two, uh, then arrow, this is the syntax which uh, defines the domain and, um, and then the body of a partial function. Okay, so um, for some of the uh, for some of the examples, uh, we will be using uh, a Java Beans, which is uh, our familiar uh, Java Bean, and the Scala alternative. Uh, so, if we have a pretty standard um, class person, which is a Java Bean, we have uh, uh, two fields: uh, name and age. Uh, which are uh, string and int. We have a constructor, we have getters, we have setters. Uh, there is no space to uh, basically include more or uh, define to string, uh, hash code equals. But I'll leave this as an exercise for you. Meanwhile, in Scala, that's what you can write for the equivalent, essentially, Code and it's not only equivalent. So this generates uh, accessors. It doesn't generate setters because the case class is actually mutable. Um, it has um, a copy factory method to uh, to create a new case class uh, based on uh, just a differing name or age. Uh, it also generates hash code equals to string, etc. So. Um, th this is maybe w one of the things which uh, initially uh, uh, Java developers are most impressed. Why do I have to uh, actually write all of the um, getters and setters and, and, and uh, uh, all of this boilerplate? It's true that IDs generate this, but you will still have to maintain this code and read it. Okay, so um, let's go to another uh, difference between the uh, how how lambda expressions in Java are implemented and, and uh, anonymous functions in Scala are implemented. So, for example, uh, one thing which uh, would be fairly intuitive for a Java uh, developer to uh, to implement is okay. Let's let's say uh, they know how to generate a stream from a list of employees, and then they can use lambdas, and there is a for each block which executes a lambda expression for each block. So, all right, what can we do with, em with employees? We can do some aggregate functions, like we can sum their salaries or, or something like that. And in Java, this is not allowed. So this will not compile in Java. Uh, the reason is only final variables are allowed to be used in uh, lambda expressions. Well, of course, it would be pretty hard for um, people to annotate everything with final. It's um, kind of boilerplate-y. So what, um, one thing which the Java compiler allows is if it can prove that 
uh, the, the variables referred to in the lambda expressions are effectively final, uh, or they don't change, uh, then uh, you can use them as is, uh, so you don't need to annotate them with, with final. Uh, and Scala, meanwhile, um, implements the classic uh, anonymous functions with closure, with, with uh, full-featured closures, which means they can bind even variables which can change. Of course, this uh, might lead to error-prone code, but since in Scala it's, um, it, it, it's more or less accepted that immutable um, data structures are used first, then this is not such a, a problem as it would have been in Java. And Brian Getz has um, numerous times said that um, it's best to work with the idioms of, uh, that, that Java programmers are used to, and when, when, they uh, uh, when a new feature is introduced, uh, we should not uh, make it uh, likely that Java developers are, are, are going to make uh, mistakes and, and, and bugs and introduce bugs. So this, for example, is would um, uh, if we're using parallel collections, this would um, introduce race conditions and the code will uh, be uh, indeterministic in some cases. Okay, so um, we mentioned that Java uh, in Java Lambda expressions uh, don't have a uh, single type, and if you want to assign to the same, um, if you want to assign to different uh, uh, types, to variables of, of different type, there is, uh, it's not easy to reuse code with, with uh, simple lambda expressions. Why, one way to work around this is method references, so you can um, define um, your behavior in a method, and it would act as a um, Basically, the the, uh, the body of the method would be the, the lambda expression. So uh, there are three types of uh, method references in Java. You can reference, for example, a static uh, method, and then uh, in a lambda expression, which takes two parameters, if the uh, static method also takes two parameters, you can just refer to it, just re replace the lambda expression with um, in this case, integer colon colon sum. So with colon colon, you can uh, refer uh, to method references, which are um, static in this case. There is another case, uh, instance variable. So if there are two parameters, and you're evoking a method on the first parameter with, um, with an argument, the second parameter, then you can again replace this. Um, with, in this case, string colon colon substring. And finally, you can refer to an instance method on, on a specific object. So if you have, uh, 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 let's say, a single parameter and, and uh, a method in an object takes, again, uh, a single um, argument of this type, you can just replace the lambda with the method reference uh, format colon colon parse. So in Scala, Scala doesn't um, really have the second type, but otherwise you can refer uh, easily uh, without any uh, special syntax to the method sum and use it in functions, in this case, reduce left. And you can also use the um, second type uh, instance uh, method of a specific object and use it in, in any uh, functions which um, expect anonymous functions as a parameter. Okay, moving on to type inference. Uh, so Java has has been using type inference, but not in too many places. So the first one was in generics, uh, when it was uh, getting pretty uh, boring to uh, list, to, to both define the type of a, a variable of a generic type, and then construct it. So in the constructor, you could omit uh, the generics. And then uh, another major place where um, uh, Java introduced type inference is exactly in Java 8. Uh, so 
type inference, uh, let, let me just clarify, that's where the compiler can infer the type. It knows what the type is already, so you don't have to write it. Um, uh, so, again, in Java, in many places, in Java 8, you don't have to specify the type of the parameters. Uh, it can get uh, boring and boilerplate pretty quickly. That's why uh, if the compiler can find out what the type is, it will uh, infer it. Uh, in Scala, it's trying to use type inference I in many, many more places. So, basically, it's... Um, uh, many variables which have a, um, a simple value, it can infer the type for them. For example, if you have a string value, you don't need to annotate uh, that the value is a string. And in many cases, it will also um, do some uh, complex, mo more complex analysis. Uh, for example, if there are branches, uh, it will do a unification of the types from both branches, for example, of an if statement. Uh, in this case, if both branches result in, in, in int values, it will reasonably conclude that the result is an int. So you don't need to annotate this, this as well. Um, one place where we have to annotate in all cases is parameters of methods. And um, this is uh, also uh, not bad because this is the one uh, may be the most significant place where you also have to annotate what you expect. So this defines the contract. Um, okay. So now that um, the architects of Java have added uh, lambda expressions, there was a problem. It, uh, um, they were not very well integrated in the existing libraries. Uh, so one way they uh, invented that um, they could easily integrate Lambda expressions would, uh, was by uh, using the so-called default methods. And they have uh, other names like virtual methods or, or defender methods. Uh, these are the names that are used in some other languages. And uh, an example is what you can do right now is in Java 8, you can define a default method in an interface. So that's something which is not very... Uh, familiar to a Java developer who, who has uh, not used Java 8. Uh, but now you can uh, define behaviors on, on uh, methods, uh, like the implementation of uh, sort in the uh, interface collection. And suddenly you can uh, get any... Um, you can get any instance of a collection in Java 8 and call the sort method on it, instead of using the a bit more unwieldy uh, utility method collections dot sort. So in Scala, um, there is, of course, a, a, a similar thing which um, is called a trait. Uh, some languages have it, like Ruby, it's uh, um, known by the name of mixin. So uh, if you have heard of Ruby mixins, this is basically the same thing. And uh, simply put, uh, traits are, uh, again, interfaces with behavior. However, Scala could have uh, some other um, things defined in a trait. For example, uh, traits can have uh, values, and uh, I don't mean that this is a static value. So this is a, a value which is um, an instance value which is inherited by, uh, by its members. And traits can also have private methods. And this is one feature uh, which is, uh, for example, considered for uh, adoption in Java 9. Um, okay, so uh, there is another difference uh, uh, in, in default methods and uh, in, in Java and um, traits in Scala. Uh, so, for example, the rules in Java are... Uh, so, first of all, there's this classic problem, which I, I'm not going to explain in too much detail you, uh, with multiple uh, inheritance, you might eventually inherit from two classes or interfaces which define the same method. So which, the implementation of which do we take? So uh, there are a couple of rules uh, which are very quickly um, uh, remind you. You, you might uh, already know this. Uh, first of all, classes always win uh, two interfaces. Uh, if there are two interfaces, the more specific one 
uh, wins, uh, the one which is a, a, a child of, of uh, another interface. And then if the ambiguity cannot be resolved, you have to resolve it uh, on your own by uh, the syntax uh, b dot super dot and the method name. So you are specifically uh, specifying uh, if if there is an ambiguity, the, the uh, behavior from which class do I take. In Scala, so, uh, okay, this looks like a lot of code, but it's uh, mostly uh, for object-oriented and functional traits, it's, it's mostly the same. In Scala, there is a way to uh, uh, resolve another way, uh, another approach to resolve this problem. Uh, for example, you can define a variable uh, with a certain type, and it could be, uh, and, and you define um, traits, so you, you can have a, a, only a single, uh, uh, inherit from only a single class, but from multiple traits. And the order in which you define the traits defines uh, which is a super type of which. So, in fact, there is never this diamond in the, in the diamond inheritance program, uh, pr a problem. It's always linearized, so there is always a single line, uh, and, and there is uh, never an ambiguity, which is apparent of, of, of which. And you can also refer to your um, super super class implementation. So in the case of these traits, functional and object oriented, uh, the result is dependent on the order uh, on which you define this. Okay, so jumping on, we have only about 15 minutes. So uh, Java streams, uh, a quick recap. Uh, Java streams are lady, uh, lazy. They have intermediate operations and they have uh, terminal operations, uh, which is actually uh, the place where you, where you say stop, now compute everything. Uh, they're traversable only once. Once you use it, you, you cannot reuse it. And they are short circuiting. So if um, there is no, uh, if you find that there is no uh, need for um, chained computations to happen, it doesn't happen. It's more efficient. Uh, so here's one example with our um, familiar uh, employees. So if if we have a uh, stream of employees, we can do many operations uh, on these. We can filter them by age. Uh, we can map the collection to a collection of, of just their salaries, and then we can um, invoke the sum method and uh, basically sum all of their uh, salaries. In Scala, it's, um, uh, there, there is more choice. So there are uh, uh, many different types of collections. Um, there are mutable and immutable ones. And also there are um, uh, there is a different uh, aspect. Uh, there are strict and non-strict collections. So non-strict collections are also um, known uh, sometimes as lazy. So uh, some lazy um, uh, collections are non-strict. And there are different ones. So the iterator is uh, more similar to what uh, Java has. So there is a single traversal. There is a view. Uh, which can be traversed mul multiple times, and there is a stream which remembers all the previous values. So uh, a, a quick uh, comparison of the collections and the um, methods which are identical to the Java ones. The first one is just using the strict version. So it's filtering everything, uh, it's filtering the employees, it, it creates um, an intermediate collection. It maps, it creates another intermediate collection, and then creates uh, and then calculates the sum. And if you don't want to uh, do all of the intermediate collections, you can call an uh, iterator, which is very, very similar, as you, you will see, with uh, um, the way stream works in Java. And then you don't have all of these intermediate collections. And what you can also do is uh, invoke a view, uh, but then at the end, you would need to force it so that you don't Recompute everything every time you uh, uh, you mention this, and there are some very uh, interesting algorithms which can be implemented elegantly with uh, lazy collections. So Scala has a lazy collection called streams, and it's not like the Java streams. Uh, 
So it's somewhat similar, but it uh, remembers, it memoizes, uh, there's a term, the, the previously computed values. So now what we can do is we can um, define a Fibonacci sequence, which is an infinite sequence. So we can define infinite sequences with lazy collections. We define the first two elements as 0 and 1. And then each new element is a sum. So what zip does is it uh, takes two collections, uh, one, one by each other. It, it creates a new collection with the tuples of the two collections. The second collection is actually the collection. So fib.tail tail is uh, an idiom in functional programming, which means the collection after the first element. So you just uh, discard the first element. So in fact, uh, the result of this is that if you take uh, the sequences, um, uh, the Fibonacci sequences starting from the first and from the second element, and uh, you can calculate um, uh, by referring to itself, to, to past values of itself, uh, and this will eff uh, 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 effectively sum uh, two consecutive elements. Okay, so we're uh, going ahead. So uh, another thing which is uh, um, reportedly one of the motivators for uh, Java 8 lambdas, another feature uh, is parallelism and parallel streams. So if you remember the our regular stream, and uh, this is essentially the same example, but we can parallelize it very easily in Java. We can just say parallel stream instead of uh, stream. And then uh, uh, many of the actions which can be parallelized are actually uh, parallelized in, in a very uh, efficient uh, manner. They are split um, and then combined. Uh, but we don't have uh, time to get into the details. And Scala has had this feature again for uh, a fairly long time, uh, you can say uh, employees.par. So uh, instead of employees, if you just put par, it parallelizes everything afterwards. Uh, OK, so uh, a quick jump through futures. Uh, Scala has a um, future which is very similar to the completable future. Completable future in Java 8 is uh, much more sophisticated than the future uh, it already had. But uh, let me just say that they're so similar that uh, so here are the most used methods in Java, and they're uh, almost exact same analogs, the, the names in Scala. Uh, OK. And finally, we're getting to the end. Uh, there is a new type in Java called optional. And as you might have guessed, uh, there is such a thing in Scala. Uh, it's called option. So uh, optional is, is for optional values. Uh, it's, it's a good replacement for uh, places where you might use null values. Like, for example, if um, in a hash table, if you uh, call the get method and you get null, you are not sure actually uh, does this value not exist in the table or it exists, but the, uh, does this key uh, not exist, or the value of the key is null. Uh, so Scala is uh, uh, there. There are a couple of differences, but uh, most of the things, uh, uh, all of the things that are in Java are also in Scala. Scala has some uh, also other options, and uh, also the advantage that its uh, uh, option type is more integrated into the standard libraries. So uh, all of the standard libraries are using option uh, wherever possible. So. One key question which uh, people uh, logically ask then uh, is, OK, so now Java 8 is so similar to Scala. It has most of the, uh, uh, the, the features that Scala has. So why should we adopt Scala at all? And uh, the, uh, Martin Odersky, the creator of the language, um, replies that, uh, in fact, 
according to him, the, that's going to speed adoption of Scala. Uh, now, uh, if uh, th this is in a way a validation of what Scala has been doing for so long, and also many of the features in Scala are, are uh, a bit more sophisticated, so people who like this style of programming uh, would really benefit if they adopt Scala. And um, as, as uh, I have hopefully shown, there are many things which Scala uh, provides in addition to uh, uh, Java 8, even for, for the same feature-by-feature -feature comparison. Um, well, why hasn't then Java implemented, uh, why hasn't it gone the, 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 the uh, the whole way, why hasn't it implemented everything the way uh, other languages have it. Uh, and here uh, the designers and architects of, of Java are uh, very, very clear. So Brian gets in uh, numerous places has uh, said that Java isn't Scala. It's uh, not a good idea to just copy a feature and paste it into a language. And the reason for that is that a language is not only its syntax, it's also a combination of what the community is using, what idioms the, the community is using. So uh, not every step is the right one. Uh, sometimes you would uh, benefit if you uh, take a step back and see if, uh, how this feature would uh, fit in the language and uh, uh, not be so zealous about implementing uh, everything straight out of everything. So, okay, so here Scala was one step ahead. Did it invent this? No, uh, actually most of the features uh, are already invented in other languages. Uh, what Scala does very well is it combines in, uh, I think, a, a unique way, object-oriented and functional programming. Um, but there are uh, other languages which have uh, pioneered uh, many of the concepts, like uh, ML has been a huge influence on Scala. Um, uh, there, there have been uh, type functions, the option type, pattern matching in, in ML for, for a very long time. It's, it's a, a very old language. I was surprised to find that it's uh, decades old. Uh, uh, Ruby uh, has influenced Scala in, in um, some of its uh, object-oriented uh, features. It has mixins, which is uh, very similar to traits. Um, everything's an object, even even what would seem like primitive types is an object you can call methods on primitive types. Uh, Scala has borrowed some of the concurrency libraries from um, Erlang, and even on the um, JVM in Java, there have been some parallel uh, libraries which have been using, actually, uh, to a certain degree functional programming, like uh, the Guava library. So it's not, uh, technically it's not older than, uh, than, than Scala, but uh, it is um, earlier than Java 8 in using uh, many of the uh, functional uh, libraries with the functional approach. Okay, so um, a couple of... Uh, Words uh, uh, of, of uh, words for uh, finalizing this presentation. So first of all, um, it's uh, I think very interesting for me personally. It was very interesting to learn Scala uh, and then learn. Uh, it was very easy for me to learn about Java. It was very interesting for me to compare and. Uh, in many places, I saw evidence how uh, Scala has influenced Java. Uh, it's it's uh, basically being on the JVM, statically typed and uh, object-oriented. It's probably the most similar language to Java. So uh, it's, it's, it's been a um, companion of Java for, for a very long time. Um, it also, I think, shows signs of things to come. So. Uh, 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 trends in, in where programming languages are going. So there is a lot of uh, convergence now. There is a, a, a feature, so languages are, are using many features and, and are become, becoming more and more alike. Uh, there are new languages like Rust and Swift, um, and if you try them, you, you'll find that there are many, uh, in many um, ways, similar to Scala. 
Uh, also, functional uh, programming is becoming more and more important. Uh, even languages which are originally designed as the functional programming languages like Erlang, Haskell, and uh, Clojure are, are, are gaining uh, popularity. And also, uh, I think what Scala is showing that types are important. And uh, there are many languages, uh, even dynamic languages, which are adopted, uh, adopting uh, something like a type system or, or at least some hybrid approach. So uh, there are typed versions of languages being created, like uh, TypeScript for JavaScript. Uh, Hack is being created as a language in Facebook, which is a typed version of PHP. Uh, Clojure, which is a, a dynamic language on the JVM, uh, he has a module uh, uh, and a type system in a module. And uh, even Erlang uh, he has a static analysis tools. Uh, so finally, I will leave you with this uh, uh, interesting uh, quote from a uh, 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 Lambda Jam conference. Functional programming won, regrettably, no one noticed. And I think that's because functional programming is very gradually uh, taking over uh, programming languages and, um, and over uh, all of the tasks that we are doing. And hopefully you will... Uh, benefit from, from this uh, one day, and hopefully Scala can help with that uh, as well. So if you, so I see time is up. I'm not sure if I have time for questions, if you're not very hungry. Is there time for questions? Yes. OK. At the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that uh, uh, Scala is a good choice for some of the project. Could you please explain when, for which project is better to use Java and for which Scala, and what are the criteria based on which we we can decide? Yeah, great question. Actually, that's probably the first question people ask. So uh, I think for a new project, uh, I I would choose Scala every time. I mean, I, I know Scala. It's it's beneficial if you already know Scala. Uh, for existing projects where uh, Java already works, there might not be. Uh, too much benefit. There are uh, certain uh, types of projects where a Scala is really uh, much better. For example, in data-centric applications like big data, streams, processing, uh, it's, it's very suitable. Um, uh, so many, many companies are adopting Scala because of this. Um, there, there, is a, uh, there are different DSLs where, where Scala is really appropriate. Uh, for example, uh, Spark, uh, for uh, distributed and, uh, and map reduce uh, idioms, is is uh, he has a Scala DSL and, and it's getting quite popular lately. For concurrency, for uh, uh, there are a couple of web frameworks which are uh, quite nice for for parsing. Uh, I probably mentioned DSLs, so th there are testing libraries which are using uh, DSLs that read like. Well, a little bit more like English, like some of the Ruby DSLs do. OK, I hope that answers the question. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask a question as well. Uh, what's the situation in Bulgaria with Scala? Are there companies developing it? Are there use groups? Uh, is there some place you can go learn? Because there are no courses in the universities. Yeah, uh, good question. and that's. Actually, a question that uh, I was very interested in when I was trying to switch from Java to Scala. Well, in, uh, in, in Bulgaria currently, uh, there is a chicken and egg problem. So companies are looking on the market. They don't see many uh, Scala developers. And so they decide, OK, it's too early to invest. And developers don't see many companies who are using Scala. Uh, I think this is starting to change to, to some degree. I, I receive some. Um, Offers from recruiters about Scala. I'm using. Uh, I'm uh, working in a, a Scala-based company for uh, four years, which which is uh, quite nice. And uh, uh, as for courses, it's it's um, uh, there are many online courses that you can take. I can recommend Coursera's uh, Functional Programming in Scala, which is led by Martin Uderski himself. Okay. You're probably hungry. OK, so if you have questions afterwards, if you think of a question, you can come by and ask me anytime. OK, thank you. <laughs>